Welcome to worship at Mosaic. We're glad you're here and we're honored to have you join us. You are welcome in this place. And we hope that this time of worship helps you to love Jesus more. We want to prepare you for what you're about to experience. Our worship is more high touch than high tech. As a missional community, ours is an embodied faith. So we spend our energy loving kids with disabilities and loving people in recovery and folks working toward their GED and all kinds of people ready to move forward with their lives. So when our people gather to worship, we look a lot like a mosaic and that may be hard to catch on the screen. So we wanted to let you know up front who we are so you'll be better able to appreciate what you experience here. There's a lot that happens among us as a community that doesn't show up on camera. And that's why we really hope you'll be inspired to find your way all the way into our community. Let us help you find a family or encounter your life in Christ or discover community or become whole or experience the Lord's presence or get to know Jesus. That's what we do best. And thanks for being with us. May God bless you richly as you worship the one who loves you best and loved you first. Friends, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to impress you, but I grew up in church. Grew up in church. I know, it's a big deal. Meaning that every Sunday morning I was in church. Consistent church going in the Bible Belt left me with a particular vision of what it meant to be a Christian. Right or wrong, here was my understanding of the Christian life. To be a Christian, I first needed to say the sinner's prayer. So at seven years old, check, got that done. Then I was to go to church, and what was most important was believing the right things. So I believed that Jesus is God's son, that he is God incarnate, that God raised him from the dead, and I was confident that when I died, I would go to heaven. Check, got that done. Then after believing the right things, I just tried to avoid the bad things, right? I didn't drink, cuss or chew, or run with girls who do. <laughs> Had it down. That's it. I got my fire insurance, and now I just tried to live a moral church-going life until I got to heaven. Now, in my mind, there were these people that I would internally classify as super-Christians, these people, uh, strange, they read their Bible regularly, they, they prayed, and if they weren't careful, they would be called to be a pastor. <laughs> or even worse, they could be called to the mission field. Now, of course, I wouldn't have openly said that these were bad calls, but I inwardly would have hoped that I would never receive such a call. Matter of fact, I did hope that I would not receive such a call. So, you see, uh, I kind of internally knew that somehow the pastor was supposed to keep a lot of people happy. And that sounded like a lot of pressure. What is worse, I learned to evaluate the message and the worship team and then talk about them in comparison with other churches in the area. Again, I'm not trying to impress you, but I was precocious. I was a rate A church shopper at an early age. That's what I'm saying. So I came to the internal unspoken conclusion that Christianity was primarily about whether one believed the right things or not, and that church membership was primarily about whether one liked the preacher and the music. Once I found a preacher and music that I liked, my job was to some point integrate what the, the pastor was preaching and mostly just to be there to evaluate how good he and the worship team were doing from week to week. I look back at those days and I cringe. Hearing your reaction makes me think I'm not the only person in this room that has approached church out of such a, such a means. Guys, I was, what was going on? I was looking at the gospel, salvation, and church through a consumer lens, right? Think about it. In a consumer-driven society, we like security. So what do we buy? We buy insurance. We buy health insurance, life insurance, homeowner's insurance. So what was the gospel? It was spiritual insurance, insurance for my soul. And what was church? It was a way of paying my monthly premiums. I would go to church once a week, worship God once a week, give some of my money, and it really didn't matter 
what church I was a part of or even how deeply integrated into that church I was, as long as I was going and giving, God and I were good. And that's really all I was after, right? What had I done? I had graciously given Christianity and the church a place to fit inside my American consumer-driven mindset. That's dangerous, my friends. What was also dangerous was what I started doing in my teenage years. Now, I know you're probably thinking I'm going to tell you about my drug days or my alcohol days, but they didn't exist. What I started doing in my teenage years was very dangerous. I started reading my Bible. I know, crazy, crazy. I was living on the edge. My parents had to pull me back. Um, (laughs) I began to notice in the New Testament that Christianity in the New Testament looked very different than the American Christianity I had experienced at that point in my life. I started reading the Gospels, and I noticed that Jesus was talking a lot about this kingdom of God. And the more I heard about this kingdom, the more I began to notice that God wasn't primarily interested in getting me to heaven. He was primarily interested in getting his kingdom to invade earth, right? That's what he was after. Thank you. So I started to read the Gospels, and I began to notice that um, the way Jesus' disciples followed him were different than the way I was following Jesus. See, friends, the Gospel is that Jesus is king, and our lives and the lives of those around us and the, the, the life of our world comes into greater peace, joy, and an original purpose the more it aligns with the kingship of Jesus. That's the gospel. So I began to notice that the disciples, the way they followed Jesus and the way I followed Jesus were very different. I noticed that I was coming to church to hear and evaluate the message and the music while Jesus' disciples were being sent out to heal the sick, drive out demons, and cleanse the leper and proclaim that the kingdom of God had come. Right? It was a very different way of discipleship. So friends, today my hope is to present a difference, present the difference between missional New Testament church and cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity being what St. Paul called uh, a form of godliness or religion without the power. Okay? So to begin, to be a missional New Testament community is to live sent by actively seeking God's invitation into countercultural community and into the work of relational healing so that our world may experience the kingdom of God, kingdom transformation. Friends, that's kind of the thesis statement. I encourage you, if you're taking notes, write that down. If you want to pull a Steve Moore from the first service, he just pulled out his phone and took a picture of it. But hold on to that. That's kind of the thesis of of where we're going today. So missional community believes that every follower of Jesus, not just pastors and staff members, are being called to live lives that actually look like the New Testament, that actually look like the New Testament. At Mosaic, we say the best way to engage a message is with a Bible, something to write with, something to write on. If you need a Bible, raise a hand. Someone will be happy to bring you one. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 13. We're going to specifically look at how King Jesus, in, in this Matthew 9 passage, gives us a master class on what missional community looks like. Picking up in verse 9. Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Friends, perhaps the most obvious question that needs to be asked regarding these sinners eating with Jesus is how is it even possible? I mean, you really need to understand the gravitas of what's going on here. Um, first of all, in the Old Testament, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies 
And he could only go there once a year. Okay, and the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant remained. So it's where the pre manifest presence of God existed. And he could only go in there once a year. And when he would go in there, he would have a rope tied around his leg. Why? That's right. If the power of God's presence overwhelmed him and he died, Levites could pull him out of the Holy of Holies without actually entering in. Friends, Moses, the lawgiver, could not see the face of God. It would kill him. So I want you to understand what's going on here. This is a big deal for these people, these sinners, reprobates, to be eating in the presence of the Messiah. How is this even possible? Hold on to that question. I'm not going to answer it right now. Um, we will get to that at the very end of the message. Guys, but first thing I want you to notice is that as our Lord and King, Jesus shows us that missional community is an active work of reconciliation. It's not a passive work. It's an active work. In a way of holiness that would make religious people shudder, Jesus is pursuing friendships with unholy people. Jesus is not waiting for Matthew to put on his Saturday best and come to synagogue. No, he's going where Matthew is and inviting him in. He is actively seeking out people that didn't naturally fit into his social circles. And in some ways, that's, that's really what ministry is most of the time. Now, let's put a little perspective on this. Matthew is a tax collector, and tax collectors were hated by their fellow Jews. Why? The Jews said they were thieves. What's that? Okay, taxes went to Rome. Okay, so there's a few things here. First of all, uh, who likes paying taxes? Nobody. But here's how tax collecting would work. Um, they would get a, a Jewish person who was a part of that community, and he would become a sellout to the Roman government, right? So he is supporting the, the very oppressors that have a chokehold on the people of Israel, okay? So, he, so he's, a, he's a turncoat. He's, he's, a, he's a Benedict Arnold. But then the second thing is this. This is how tax collecting worked in that culture. The, the Roman government would tell Matthew, hey, John needs to pay $2,000. Matthew would go to John's door, knock on it, and say, hey, Rome says you need to pay $4,000. Guess where the other $2,000 would go? In Matthew's pocket. And guess what John could do? Absolutely nothing, right? Um, and to, um, to make matters worse, Matthew actually has another name. Does anybody know what Matthew's other name was? Levi. It was Levi, okay? That's really significant because it means there's a pretty decent chance he was from the tribe of Levi. What was the tribe of Levi? What was distinctive about the tribe of Levi? They were the priestly tribe. They were the tribe of Israel that was specifically charged with looking after the spiritual welfare of Israel. They are the tribe that are called to teach the people of Israel how to be holy, how to be set apart from the pagan cultures around them. And here is Matthew, possibly a Levite, as a sellout to the Roman government, right? He is completely failing at his identity as an Israelite, at his call as a Levite. And don't think Jesus wasn't immune, or that Jesus was just somehow immune to this because he was Jesus. Jesus wasn't as human, right? He probably knew people who had been, probably had friends and family who had been cheated by Matthew, and yet he still seeks him out. Friends, missional community recognizes that the sinfulness of the human condition is deeper than we naturally think. It's deeper than we naturally think. It recognizes that the brokenness of the human condition is deeper than we think. And while it doesn't condone sinfulness, it does make an allowance for people to be on a journey. Right? On a journey towards wholeness. So missional church calls us to look beyond our own prejudices, beyond Democrat or Republican, beyond past experiences, to see people as people who are truly broken but also truly sought after by the love of God. This means that missional New Testament community is often a messy and misunderstood form of countercultural community. 
I'm serious. If you take it seriously, people will question why you do what you do, why you hang out with who you hang out with. Notice in verse 10 that while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. What was Jesus' reward for hanging out with one reprobate sinner? A lot more reprobate sinners, right? And friends, this is a big deal because in Jewish culture, particularly in this time, to have dinner with someone was a sign of friendship was a sign of extending friendship. And this brings us to a major theme shift between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Jews were given many dietary laws. What was the real point behind the dietary laws? Anybody know? This is why the Pharisees were so astonished by Jesus eating with the sinners. They they haven't picked up on the theme shift yet. The reason why there were so many dietary laws in the Old Testament was God wanted to prevent the people of Israel from having dinner and making friendships with the pagan cultures around them. Why? Because he didn't want them picking up their sinful behaviors and pagan rituals. He was trying to put distance between them. So what is Jesus revealing? Jesus is revealing that, well, let me ask this question before we get to what Jesus is revealing. What happened to Jesus when he was baptized? The Holy Spirit descended on him. What did Jesus do at Pentecost? He poured out his Holy Spirit. What's the point? A Holy Spirit-empowered church can now hang out with sinners can now hang out with people of pagan cultures and actually be the people of influence rather than being influenced by sin around us, right? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So first recognize that being filled with the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential, absolutely essential to the missional call to seek out countercultural community, relational healing, and kingdom transformation. Otherwise, the influence of those around you will be greater than the influence, uh, or your influence on them. But you may be saying, well, Christopher, I became a Christian a long time ago, and yet I'm still not seeing things in my life that really looks like New Testament Christianity. What am I missing? That's a great question. I'd say, first of all, get in a circle and then seek to know people outside that circle. Get in a circle and then seek to get to know people outside the circle. Notice in verses 11 and 12, uh, it's Jesus and his disciples, presumably his 12, that are eating with the tax collectors and sinners. Friends, pay attention to this. This is a big deal. Jesus had created a countercultural social circle of disciples into which he could invite the tax collectors and sinners into, right? Right? If Jesus needed a circle to be a part of to do real ministry, it's very possible that we also might need a circle to be a part of to do ministry. Amen? And Mosaic, we like circles, right? We do. Why? Because we believe that community is essential. And it's in those circles of community that we receive healing. Call it a shameless plug, and it is. (laughs) But I'm also just dealing with the text as it is. Jesus essentially takes his life group to the tax collectors and sinners and allows the tax collectors and sinners not just to get to know him, but to get to know his disciples. That's how ministry works. So I want you to begin to think of your life group or ministries such as Kid City, Epic, the Mosaic Center as a missional unit, right? Almost like it's a military unit. I want you to think of your circles as small countercultures that become a safe place to invite those outside of your circle so that they can begin to experience the renewal of God. So we get in circles, and then we seek to get to know people outside of that circle. And it's often in these relationships that the kingdom of God begins to break in. Friends, here at Mosaic, we've been blessed to get to do some fun stuff. Amen? Uh, as, as Julia told you, uh, the pantry does some really cool things. We get to feed the hungry. Um, because of the people in the GED um, program, 
Folks with educational needs get, get raised up. Exceptional circles are ministering to regularly to kids and adults with developmental delays. And the Holy Spirit, frankly, does some really cool things around here. It's not uncommon for someone to get a prophetic word for someone else. Uh, inner healing ministry, um, healing of emotional trauma and memories is actually, I won't say common, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty common practice, I guess, is the best way of saying it here. I would also say deliverance ministry. God does a lot of deliverance ministry here. And it's really pretty amazing to see some of the things that Jesus does in our midst. But if I'm honest, it almost never happens outside of the context of real relationship. It always happens in a relationship. I've seen, friends, I've seen more people free from, freed from demons than I ever expected to see in ministry. I mean, I'm just being honest as I can be. But 99% of the time, those deliverances have come out of the context of me really getting to know people. People that I never would have gotten to know if it weren't for Jesus seeking them out through me. If it weren't for me developing a relationship with them just motivated by rec the reconciling love of God. Friends, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying develop friendships so that you can see God do cool things. That's just using people, right? What I'm saying is pursue friendships with people around you for the sake of loving your neighbor as yourself, because that's the second greatest commandment. And then God, who loves your neighbor a lot more than you do, will do some pretty amazing things through you out of sheer love for that person. That's how ministry works. That's really what uh, the pantry team was telling you all about. It's a tired cliche, but love really is the answer. And let me say this. I think this is the place where a lot of us who long to see supernatural ministry have kind of missed it. It flows from love. It's not a substitute for love. Seeing people get freed up flows from love. It's not a substitute for love. Seeing people get healed flows from love. It's not a substitute for love. And let me say this, friends. It's a right thing to want to see the sick get healed, to want to see uh, those with demons get delivered, to want to see the captives get set free. That's a right and holy thing. Why? Because it's just New Testament Christianity. Desire it. But desire it as, a, as an expression of the love of God at work in and through you. And let me say this, guys. Um, when we love our neighbor as ourselves, we actually get close enough to know what hurts them. We actually get close enough to know what their wounds are, the real wounds, the wounds that are behind the presenting issues. It's typically only then that we can see what Jesus actually wants to do in their lives. And this is where the difficulty is. Because to be close enough to know what really hurts people often means you're close enough to be hurt by them. Think about that. To be close enough to, to know what hurts someone also means that you're kind of vulnerable. You're, you're, you're open uh, to being hurt by them. Consequently, what we often want in ministry is we want the miracle without the mess. But that's just not how Jesus works. The truth is, missional church doesn't simply call us to healing ministry. Missional community calls us to simultaneously seek our own healing and in the process be a part of how God is wanting to heal those around us. Right? It's both and. It's not either or. And we become what Henry Nouwen called wounded healers. And perhaps this is what we fear at the deepest levels. Perhaps this is why missional church, hear me on this, this is why missional church is very attractive on paper and very hard in practice. Notice in verse 12, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Any of us who have had surgery understand that it's a pretty vulnerable thing to put your body in the hands of a surgeon, right? Because the same doctor that God's going to use to heal you is going to hurt you first, right? Notice in verse 
13 and 14, or excuse me, uh, 13, it says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Friends, he's quoting Hosea 6, chapter 6, or chapter six verse 6. I think to really understand what he's saying, you kind of need to pay attention to what verses 4 and 5 of that same passage uh, say. In, in verse 4, it says, Your love is like the morning mist. It's like early dew that disappears. What is he saying? Your love for me. God is speaking to the Jews, and he's saying, Your love for me is not grounded. It's not rooted. It, it vanishes in the heat of the day. And then he says this, Therefore I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. You know what the mercy of God is? The mercy of God is him loving you enough to cut you with his words. It's cutting us to pieces so that as the master surgeon, he can open up those old wounds that are, have gotten infected and he can begin to clean it out and let us really heal. And here's the scary thing. Often God accesses the deeper places in us through the messy relationships around us, right? Often how he gets into the woundedness is by the people around us. Friends, in my own life, I grew up with a rageaholic who was bitterly critical and emotionally abusive. Now, for the record, this was no one in my immediate family. But the relationship had a profound impact on me. And guess what? When I get around, uh, get into relationships with people with anger issues, a lot of that brokenness comes to the surface, right? My dishonesty in the form of people pleasing shows up. My fear in the form of perfectionism rises to the top. I grew up the middle child who worked hard to fix family issues and keep the peace. So guess what? When people come to me with their issues, I feel an innate responsibility to do what? <laughs> fix it, right? I try to be Jesus rather than simply lead them to Jesus. Guys, what is God doing? He's using the messy people around me to cut into the wounds that have gotten infected over the years so that he can bring healing. He's not content for me to be a people pleaser for the rest of my life. He's not content for me to live out of fear in the form of perfectionism for the rest of my life. He's not content for me to be codependent. He wants me to uh, mature into everything that it means to be a follower of Jesus. To close, I want to get back to the question of how is it possible that sinners and tax collectors could eat with Jesus? How could they simply eat in the presence of the Messiah? I suspect that as Jesus was breaking bread with um, these tax collectors and sinners, that somewhere he was thinking about the fact that his body was about to be broken for them. Why? Because, friends, the cross, the cross is the justice and holiness of God coming into perfect marriage with the absolute love of God. The cross is God taking on the penalty of our sinfulness so at the same time he could invite us into his presence. That's what's going on here. And so friends, as we re reflect on Jesus' very vulnerable work of loving on the cross, the Spirit will call us and frankly empower us to take up our own cross and vulnerably love those in front of us. Missional community is just a reflection of of the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. It means as Jesus left heaven and entered our world, we leave our comfort zones. We allow ourselves to get close enough to people to love them, which means we allow ourselves to get close enough to be hurt by them and so identify with the cross. But even in pain like Jesus, we look for the resurrecting power of God, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us. 
The cross and the resurrection is the key to all ministry. Friends, I want deeply for your lives to experience more and more a Christianity that is missional, that is New Testament, in form, power, joy, and fruit. That's what I want for you. So as we enter into a time of prayer, you can come on up, Tevin. As we enter into a time of prayer, I want you to consider where you are and what God's next step for you is. For some of you, you know, maybe you're kind of new to this thing. You've been coming to Mosaic for a little while, but you still need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like you're coming to believe that Jesus is Lord, but it's time to place your allegiance in Him as Lord. It's time, it's, it's time to receive the fullness of His Holy Spirit. For some of you, you have been following Jesus for a while. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. But you've yet to take that step into being an active part of a circle, right? You need to join a life group or you need to join a ministry where you can be discipled and disciple others. Because hear me on this, friends, I, and I mean this with great love and compassion. Unless you're in a circle, it's hard to have a place to invite someone who's outside of the circle into it, right? And that's, that's why mission happens inside of community. Maybe you are in a circle, but it's time to become incarnational. Friends, incarnational means putting your body where the action is. I hope that for some of you, there is a restlessness. There is a sense of a desire to begin to live with the vulnerability, the missional vulnerability that Jesus lived with. But if we're honest, the truth is, most of us are scared, myself included. Most of us, we're scared of our own woundedness, and we're scared of the wounded, woundedness of others around us, right? Friends, let me say this. Missional vulnerability is not an invitation to put on the Christian smile and act like everything's okay. That was probably the other piece of my experience in church as a kid that I wish I could have gotten rid of. I'm sad that I learned how to have the argument in the car and then go, everything's great, love you guys, God is good. That doesn't serve anyone. Friends, missional vulnerability means that we become honest about our own brokenness. And frankly, some of us are overdue for a heart-level conversation with a fellow sojourner. We've kind of learned to live with good enough for too long, and consequently, we become disconnected from our hearts rather than seeking God's healing for our hearts. I invite you right now to ask yourself, am I as free as Jesus would have me be? Or am I settling for tolerable when Jesus wants to make me whole? If that's you, I want to lovingly invite you to talk with me or talk to Carolyn when she comes back or Talk to one of the staffers so that you can begin to experience the healing of Jesus over your own soul. And you can start to experience the freedom to be a wounded healer. I want to finish with this thought, y'all. A wounded healer heals out of a place of weakness and vulnerability. A wounded healer doesn't have superficial answers. They don't look at people and go, God will never give you more than you can handle. No, a wounded healer can feel enough to feel the pain of the other person and invite Jesus into that pain. Friends, as wounded healers, you'll start to find the grace to get to know people in your world, to have a real conversation with that acquaintance at work, or to call up and invite to coffee somebody that's been heavy on your heart. And as you find healing, you'll find the grace to love the Matthews in your world, the people who are outside of your circle and let them know that there's actual room inside of the circle. So I want you to stand with me and, and pray and let's just listen. Let's just listen for God. Lord, Lord Jesus, 
I just ask you to speak to every heart in this room to make us aware of what our what the invitation is that you're giving us for the next step. What the invitation is that you're giving each of us for our next step. Yes, Lord. Just listen for the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. God, I pray that you would give us courage and boldness to step into the next step. Lord, to put us on the path of being wounded healers, people that... uh, seek you for our healing and yet also seek to be a part of your healing for the world. Lord, I just, I ask for that. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would just anoint us for that. Yeah. And God, I I pray that for the culture of this church. That this would be a church that welcomes the sinners and the tax collectors of our day because we recognize our own brokenness. Yeah. And recognize that you are Lord, that you are God, that you are the one who can heal, you are the one who can deliver. Just pray for that, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. Amen.